Ladies and gentlemen, the students, let's welcome Mr. Nasser to Utah Valley University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor Lado. So I was asked to speak on uh, why multilateralism matter and why do, should you care about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, these 17 goals. Maybe multilateralism is a new concept, but how many of you have taken a flight on a plane? How many of you look at your uh, weather forecast to find out what's the weather like next day? All of us, yes? So many of you think of the United Nations as this glass tower in New York where member states meet governments, ambassadors, and they talk about global issues, and then the Security Council, and sometimes they agree and sometimes they don't agree. Sorry, it's, it loves being close. So. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. But the UN is much, much more than that. The UN is a system of organizations, about 53 UN organizations. The largest humanitarian organization in the world is part of the United Nations called the World Food Program. And every year, they are responsible for providing assistance and food aid to 80 million people. Currently, there are 68.5 million displaced people. 22 million of them are refugees displaced outside of their own country. They are provided with support and assistance by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, High Commission for Refugees, which is part of the UN organization. 45% of the world's children are provided vaccines with the support of UNICEF, an organization of the United Nations system. And I mentioned flights. What enables all these planes to fly and not collide with each other and coordinate is an international system, part of the UN system called the I in IMO, International, I IOTA, International Organization for Organizing the uh, Aviation. And IOM is International Organization for Migration, which works for, for now during the UN system. The IMO, International uh, Meteorological Organization, is what coordinates all the information that is feeding into data that is used by television and uh, websites, what is the weather like and predictions for that. And they are an important part of the system of organizations that are coordinated by the United Nations Framework for Climate Change that is, has been looking at and gathering the science and looking at the impact. So every aspect of your life whether you know it or not, is actually touched by one branch of the United Nations or another. Now, to come back to the core issues that the UN is known for is, of course, issues of peace and security. The UN was created after the Second World War to protect future generations from the scourge of war, as the words of the Charter say. But also, it includes references to working together to create prosperous and harmonious relations between nations. Now what you see occasionally, because that's often what makes the news, is gridlock or uh, inability, inability to reach a resolution in the Security Council, because that's what makes the news. But what doesn't make the news is all the other times when they do actually reach agreement, whether in the Security Council or in the General Assembly. 80% of resolutions that are actually implemented in adopted by the UN are adopted by consensus. And that is new. It, it all started in the early 90s after the Cold War ended. I think as we enter this era of globalization, where problems are now defined in their global nature, that problems have no borders. You talk about terrorism, terrorism, global terrorist networks, they are not stopping at borders. They are now recruiting through the internet in other countries. They are collaborating with each other. And they are able to strike or recruit or create lone wolf inspired attacks in other parts of the world. So how do you work to deal with those without coordinating and working together and setting certain ground rules? And of course, the United Nations Secretary General, the current one, the previous one, and the one before him, have often stressed the importance is as you fight terrorists and terrorism, we need not lose sight of the importance of protecting human rights. Because human rights and civil rights 
should not be trampled in the name of combating terrorism or extremism. And I think these are also core elements. <coughs> we often talk about the three pillars on which the United Nations work is based. Peace and security is one of those, and you cannot imagine the number of agreements that have been facilitated by the United Nations. And prevention is a priority for the current Secretary General, but prevention is often hard to prove. We see there are conflicts taking place, but you don't see other conflicts that didn't take place. And that is often because of mediation, or often because of working behind the scenes to prevent the conflict from taking place. You take a vaccine, and sometimes if you don't get the influenza or whatever it is that you took the vaccine for, you don't think, well, why did I bother and, and, and have that pain in, in that needle in my butt? Actually, uh, you could have gotten that influenza and you could have gotten really sick or something else. Counterfactual outcomes are inherently uncertain. So we cannot prove that the UN's intervention in the Sahel prevented a major uh, famine or a major crisis three years ago. But that actually is what happened through the work and collaboration of different UN agencies and the Secretary General and member states, of course. And when the UN works with member states and in different regions, we don't just work with the local governments, with the governments, national governments. We also work with regional organizations. That's actually covered in the Chapter 8 in the United Nations Charter. Working with regional organizations that are more um, able to get their act together in their region. So we work a lot with the African Union for African in African issues, with the EU, of course, on global issues to do with the, whatever happening in Europe, with the organization of American Latin American states, with the League of Arab States, with ASEAN. So often a solution has to involve those most affected within it. So on the peace and security aspect, it is one of the core pillars of the United Nations and we continue to think that we need to do more than we are doing. The Secretary General, the current one, Antonio Guterres from Portugal, he started 1st of January 2017. He came with an agenda that prevention is a key, is priority for him, but also that we need to change and transform the way we do our work in peace and security, in the development system, and in management. He spoke about us being an organization that was created in the 20th century, but we are dealing with 21st century problems. So we need to get over certain aspects of the way we do things. And there's a series of reforms that are taking place. I won't bore you with those. There's a whole website that is only dedicated to reform, the development system reform, the development reform, and the peace and security pillar reform. So those you can look at and see for yourselves. The second pillar on which the UN's work is based is the development. And now I hesitate to use the word development without adding to it sustainable development, which is actually a new concept that has also emerged as part of the discussions that take place within the United Nations. The third one is human rights. And of course sustainable development, people associate with these 17 goals and that's what comes to people's mind. <coughs> human rights is, for me, is a key pillar of the work of the organization because not only are we all born free and equal in dignity and rights, as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, which, by the way, this year, 10 December, marks the 70th anniversary of the adoption of that document. <coughs> it was a key document, a key milestone, Adopted in 1948, and the United States played a key role. Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the, uh, actually, co-chairs of the process that led to its adoption in 1948. And the 30 articles in that declaration are still as valid today as they were then. And if you go back to 1948 and look at the world and how it was in 1948, the United Nations was created by 51 member states. Those were the independent states. Today we have about 93 member states. Where did they come from? They were all colonized member states. So the majority of the world's population wasn't actually free. 
even the countries that participated in, in the drafting of that declaration, they either were colonial powers, are you ruling over others, uh, or had their own problems of segregation and civil rights violations. Yet that document was an inspirational, looking forward document that you can look back and say, which article of the 30th uh, articles do you think can be changed? I don't think you will find one. It is the most translated document on the planet and it has laid the ground for most human rights conventions and regulations around the world. It has become inspirational and it is the basis on which all countries and all organizations measure the achievement of human rights and where human rights are in a country or not. You probably find it surprising everybody now hears about the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. The UN was created in 1945, but the actual creation of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was in 1993. So it took us almost 40, uh, 50 years or 45 years to get to that point. And it started as a small office. The current High Commissioner, uh, Bachelet, uh, she's a former president of Chile, former head of uh, UN Women. Actually, she was the first executive director of UN Women when UN Women was created in 2010, Michelle Bachelet. Uh, she is now the current High Commissioner for Human Rights, and she took over from uh, Prince Raad, uh, Zaid bin Raad al Hussein, who was from Jordan. And that office has now become the key, sort of like the conscience, and the mandate is to call out human rights violations and, and, and we see that they are actually doing that and often references are to what they do. Going back to multilateralism and why does it matter? You will hear sometimes politicians talk about going it alone. But which problem can you deal with globally alone? I mentioned terrorism. What about organized crime? Law, law enforcement need to work with others across borders to be able to work with that. And again, you have to do that in coordination and in compliance with international humanitarian law or international law. Diseases. Viruses do not know borders. And some of you might remember, maybe you were still in high school, uh, the Ebola crisis a couple of years ago in West Africa. And the threat and the challenge of dealing with this virus that for the first time went from isolated small communities and villages to major cities in Africa, whether it was in Sierra Leone, Liberia, or uh, Cote d'Ivoire. At some point it reached Nigeria, at some point there were cases here in the United States. But countries came together at the United Nations, and we created the first ever United Nations Health, called UNIR, Emergency Mission for Ebola. And that was coordinating the work that was taking place on the ground, the World Health Organization, our UN country offices, the peacekeeping missions that we had in that region, and the individual efforts and bilateral support coming from abroad. Coordination in the humanitarian area is key. What happens in a humanitarian crisis is often unexpected. Like when there was the tsunami that hit in Indonesia and parts of Asia in, in the space of a couple of hours, 250,000 people were swept away and never uh, rescued. Communities destroyed. Uh, like Haiti in earthquake. So of course, humanitarian organizations want to rush to the scene, and you see that, and there's everybody wants to help. But what would happen if every organization came and brought blankets, and nobody brought water? Or every organization came and brought tents, and nobody brought fuel? Or everybody brought the same kind of medicine, but no food? So that needs to be coordinated, and the UN provides that coordination mechanism, and it is accepted as the neutral, impartial coordinator, because we still live in a world where there is mistrust. So if you are in a certain country or a certain community, you might look with suspicion at somebody coming from another country that might have interests in your country or may not, and saying, what is their agenda? 
But if you come with a multilateral flag, the UN flag, and saying we represent all nations and our agenda is the Charter, Universal Declaration, and Humanitarian Imperative, we are here to help, then you get a certain level of response. 2005 was uh, my last year in New York in a, in a different capacity, and the annual universal humanitarian appeal, which is the collective needs of what the UN and its partners think is needed for the coming year to deal with the humanitarian crisis, was about $5 billion. That was 2005. This year, it was $24 billion. And that shows you the extent of change and the extent of additional humanitarian crises that ha are taking place and happening that are being coordinated and supported by the United Nations. And many of those are caused by conflict, yes, but others are caused by natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, but if you dig down, climate change. Nobody is still using the term that there's different political issues around the term climate change refugees, but the word we use is people becoming refugees because of conditions created by climate change. And climate change, I think for the most part, created a bit of confusion because for the most part of the 90s and early parts of this century, people were talking about global warming. And when you think of it, global warming, what is an additional degree or two going to do to the planet? But the science and the scientists have actually looked deep into this. And the majority of scientists, and I'm talking about legitimate and real science, agree that current climate change that is happening, that is impacting the world, is caused by human action. You will hear people say there are dissenting scientists. There are actually very, very few dissenting scientists and some documentaries and we'll show some of those have ties to certain lobby groups or certain industries. The real scientists, the majority of scientists uh, agree that climate change is happening and climate change isn't just global warming. Implications of climate change as we are now looking at it is that severe weather phenomena are going to increase. So if your region is dry, it's going to be drier. If you're receiving rain, you'll get more rain, and we have seen that. Storms and superstorms are going to be more frequent and more devastating. Of course, everybody thinks of rising sea levels. When one or two degrees at the global planetary level happens, or three degrees, as the fear might be, then ice cap all the ice and I in Greenland, in the North Pole, the South Pole, would melt. And that will lead to rise in sea levels. And those predictions go from, depending on where and how we end up, a few feet to 60 feet. Can you imagine when Salt Lake City isn't on the coast? But the majority of the world's large metropolises are on the coast. The majority of humanity lives on the coast. And much of the land that we use to grow crops and food is near. Those would go under. There are some nations, uh, an island, small island nations, that actually could disappear with, with unchecked climate change and sea uh, level rise. Take that aside. Acidity in the oceans, ocean acidity is increasing because carbon dioxide is how many ever parts per million there is in the atmosphere, and it's the most we have ever had since measurement we're identifying it. It dissolves in the ocean, it becomes more acidic. And in the last couple of years, 25% uh, or more of the coral reef in uh, near Australia bleached. So coral reef bleaching means it starts to die, it turns white and then it dies. And coral reefs are part of the important part of actually the life cycle in oceans. So you're destroying fish nurseries that will impact other fish that eat that fish that eat that fish and then of course the food resource that we rely on is also going to be diminished. So looking forward, and this is why Secretary General Antonio Guterres 
has stressed, and this year he's already given like three major speeches on climate change, is that this is his number one priority for now, because being able to achieve this, all of these, is also contingent in us being able to control the effect and impact of climate change and the climate action that we need to take to ensure that at least we mitigate some of the damage that is already happening, that we protect and support resilient uh, and create more resilient communities and facilities. So that's why he's calling for a summit next year, 24 September at the UN. He's inviting leaders from all walks of life, from government, from regional governments, from local government, from civil society, from the private sector, from academic institutions, universities, to come with solutions, to come with plans for actions, to where and how we are going to back on track to not only fulfill the agreement, Paris Agreement that was reached in December of 2015. We're actually not on track even to stay uh, the course on that. But how do we go back on, on that track? So. If you take all these issues together, the only place and main place to have countries come together and discuss and talk about those issues is the United Nations. People can talk and refer to the G20, the G7, the World Bank, the EU, the Council of Europe, all of these are important, but at the end of the day, they are not as inclusive. They do not include the interests of smaller states of states that feel maybe their interests aren't represented in those conferences and therefore there's no feeling of ownership and maybe they will not feel obliged to to work in those issues. So when world leaders came together in September of 2015 and agreed the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and people sometimes refer to them as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and I often say, no, they are not the United Nations Development Goals. They are actually your goals. They were adopted by world leaders, but the feed, the, what they were fed, the process, included consultations and meetings and conferences that involved 10 million people around the world. We had something called My World Survey, which was done online, but also in other parts of the world. We had volunteers, NGOs, our colleagues in the UN country offices going around talking to communities. If the world leaders are going to come together and agree on an agenda to achieve by the year 2030, what do you think needs to be on that agenda? And 60% of those who participated in that survey were young people. And young people today represent the largest generation the world has ever seen in terms of young people. Youth and the UN defines youth as between the age of 18. Officially, there are different definitions within the UN, so UNICEF, UNFPA, other UN agencies, might, but it's between 18 and 27, or 28. There are 1.8 billion young people around the planet today. That's the largest generation of youth the world has ever known. And if you take the younger people, there are more young people today on the planet than, than, than any time before. Actually, there are more people living today on the planet, seven and a half billion people, than all humans who have walked the planet since, since uh, we walked out of Africa. So if you take all humans, all the history that you have read, and all of these nations and peoples, and ancient Greeks and Romans, and add them all together, there are less than the number of people who are living on the planet today. And by current projections, by the year 2050, we expect there will be 9 billion people. And by the year 2100, there will be 11 billion people living on the planet. Outside of New York, in the US, that's going to be interesting. So we did some of our own checking with the legal department, with the State Department. How do we go about doing that? Because it's a UN conference taking place on US soil. At UN, we are sort of outside of that. We, are, we have a special status, so we don't have to take these issues into consideration. But everybody was very encouraging, and uh, the governor, the mayor, and in the UN, when things stars aligned, we announced in August that we were happy to accept the offer to come to Salt Lake City. And since it is in Salt Lake, and Salt Lake City is a city that prides itself 
in the work they do in creating inclusive, safe, and sustainable communities. So we are going to be focusing on SDG. Can anybody tell me what number that would be? 11. 11. True. So we look forward to that, and hopefully you can attend and participate. So I actually spoke a bit longer than I wanted to, but uh, I'll stop now so that we can have some uh, questions if you have any. Please. All the uh, NGOs will be attending that conference for sure. But as students, if we have an opportunity to attend uh, with it dealing with STG 11, what do you hope we'll get out of it as students? SDG 11 is the overall arching theme, but I think we always say that the SDGs are interconnected and, and that you cannot really take one and saying this is mine because it impacts how do you build safe, secure, inclusive, sustainable societies and communities without taking action to ensure that the marginalized, the, the ones who have no voice in your community are given a voice. So human rights access, reducing inequalities, dealing with the, are part of that. Dealing with climate change impacts that. So it's, it's interconnected, but the participation, yes, the participation is open for NGOs and youth and young people who are not associated with NGOs, who are students at universities, we are looking at ways for making it possible for you to participate and attend. So we, we will open the opportunities for universities that are associated with the department, but also universities that are supporting the conference, to have a certain number of participants. The, the assumption we have is that the attendance will be capped at 5,000 participants. That would be more than double the largest number we've ever had in those conferences, or almost double. So I am, I'm not sure we will hit that, but people tell me you will. But uh, we will open registration as of January, and, and I think students and young people will definitely have the opportunity to participate, but we don't want you just to participate. We want you to actually also take part in the talks, in the discussions, present. And this is what I tell young people. Do not wait to be invited to the table. Take your place. It's about your future. So if somebody is closing the door and saying we are discussing youth issues, and you're outside, break that door and walk in and saying, give me my space at the table. Okay? Yes, please. Can we have time for maybe one more question? Can we have a question back there? Yes, yes, there. Yes, please. Speak loud because it's hard to hear. So, um, which country is doing the most to uh, combat climate change? You're not going to know what that is a very difficult question to, to answer because every, a number of countries will tell you we are committed to meet, and some countries, Sweden has actually met, last year Sweden met, they already fulfilled their emission targets according to the Paris Agreement. There may be other countries that have done that, but we have to go beyond specific countries, and I give an example based on an article that came out in the New York Times on Sunday. There was, uh, I don't know if, if you saw it, but there was, in 10, 15 years ago, somebody came up with saying biofuels are less harmful in terms of climate uh, than, than diesel or, or fossil fuels. So there was a rise in like, let's mix biofuels, we need more, more uh, uh, What's it called? The sea, the the oil tree. Uh, gosh, the corn, but uh, ethanol. Well, ethanol eventually, but palm, palm palm oil. So palm oil. So there was a major demand for palm oil, which resulted in big chunks of forest rainforest in Indonesia being chopped down and burnt so that they can grow palm oil to export so that you have less reductions in, 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 in carbon emissions in the US. And that was the, the article in the New York Times was explaining and all, all the details. But then the fact the actual burning of the forests that created more carbon monoxide and more emissions that were worse on the planet. So I think what is important is that yes, every country needs to see what's doing inside, but they have to, we have to coordinate and work 
across the planet because we live in the same the same planet. This is this is the issue about global problems that require global solutions. You cannot put a border that will stop the hurricane or the tornado or the tsunami or the rain or the drought. It's going to just move along. Please. Um, since the United Nations or one of the goals that United Nations um, always promote for is no poverty, no hunger. I want to know how the United Nations um, according to the recent cut for the people in Gaza, the $200 million in aid. Like, what's the mechanism that United Nations consider to cut the aid for the hungry, the people without, like, necessities every day, you know, mm -hmm. suffering everything, and increasing the aid on the other hand to the Israelis. So, where is the mechanism here? Where is the fear in this? That's what I'm asking. But that wasn't the United Nations. That was the United States government. And yeah. would you support that? Look, the Secretary General, the Commissioner General of UNRWA, uh, and, and every UN agency, basically, their position is, yes, okay, this is nobody, this is your sovereign decision as a government, but we think it's the wrong decision, because the needs and services of UNRWA, I went to schools run by UNRWA. I'm a Palestinian refugee myself. I worked for UNRWA for 17 years. So UNRWA is the least known UN organizations, but one of the most effective and best success stories there are. 1948, it started working. 70% of the work it was doing was relief, providing tents, food, to 750,000 refugees. Today, 70% of its budget and staff are in education. The Palestinians are the most highly educated refugees in the world, right. in the Middle East, and they were the ones who basically in, contributed to the build-up of the Gulf countries. So the crisis with the cutting of the funding to UNRWA was sudden, unexpected, mm -hmm. Because historically, the United States government was the largest contributor to the agency's budget. Sure. It often provided about a third of the budget. So, beginning of 2018, they had disp gave 65 million and withheld 300 million. But what has happened, and this is again the amazing story, is that the United Nations Secretary General supported the Commissioner General, and we organized a number of extraordinary uh, meetings and fundraising events. Last week, the High Commissioner for UNRWA announced uh, the deficit has been brought down from $460 million to $21 million. Okay. So there were additional contributions that came from different countries, from individuals. There's a U.S. Uh, UNRWA has a... The same way there's a UNICEF, National Committee for UNICEF, there's a UNRWA USA, which is an organization actually I helped create when I was with UNRWA in, in, in New York. And they are being very active and raising funds from American people in America. And they, they have been able to raise two to three million dollars a year. They organize these 5K races. Uh, they just did one in Houston. Maybe you should invite them to do one in Salt Lake City at some point, And then they will uh, come and talk about that solution. Thank yeah? you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a couple of announcements uh, for your information. And number one is all the lectures, the uh, dignitary lectures that we have here on campus, they're all videotaped. And we have a channel, a UVU Global Office for Global Engagement uh, channel. So you will be able to hear. He has a mic, so <laughs> the videotape has been well recorded so you'll be able to hear the whole lecture uh, beautifully. We're going to be working on getting a, a new system here or something so everyone can actually hear better. Uh, second, uh, if you don't have an SDG pen, we will be more than happy to give it to you. I uh, just talked to my colleague here, Amy, and she'll be able to issue you a, a SDG so you can become a promoter of, of this uh, great uh, cause. And, uh, and last, uh, we are so honored to have Mr. Nasser with us, and he's such a great professor, so what else than to offer him our guest professor award from Utah Valley University. So on behalf of UVU, we would like to present this token of thank you, a memento thank you. Uh, to you for your time here at UVU. Thank you very much. Thank you.